I've here. Okay, let me. Started. Okay, you can get started. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Guys, we are so excited that we have um, all of you guys on this call and just kind of wanted to introduce our community a little bit and then I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Chasma Walla. So, um, you know, we, this community has been around for, for a while and kind of our big umbrella name is Health Made Simple, but kind of our smaller group that we've kind of created here um, is called Lifestyle Over Medicine. And that's, that's, that's really, that's really what we um, love to talk about because there's so many things that we can do to help our situations no matter what. I mean, I always tell my patients, I'm a physical therapist by trade, but I always tell my patients that our body has an amazing ability to heal if we give it the right environment. And I so, so, so believe that. And part of my journey with this was, you know, when I was in my late twenties, I grew up super active. I literally was, um, you know, in sports at the age of two because I was had, had so much energy and got into gymnastics and was a competitive gymnast and then played soccer and then college soccer and semi-professional soccer and got into marathon training. And literally by the end of my twenties, um, my body completely fell apart. Like I looked fit on the outside, but on the inside it was a completely different story. And, and I really thought I was doing well because, because I looked fit and I exercised and I thought that was a big part of health. And I thought if I, you know, was really eating bad that I literally like, um, you know, I wouldn't look like this. And really there's, there's a difference. There's a difference between being fit. And there's a difference between being healthy. And I was fit, but I wasn't healthy. And, and literally in a two and a half year period of time in my twenties, I literally had bronchitis, pneumonia, and then cancer and um, dealt with the cancer for two and a half years, two surgeries. Um, and it was, it was a virus. It, it was a virus that just kept on attacking me. And I kept on asking the doctors, what can I do? And they said, there's nothing you can do. Your body will heal eventually. And I kind of got sick of the answer. I'm like, I'm, d I'm done with this because you're not giving me any tools. I know there's things that I can do. And so that's when my journey started as far as like looking for information. And still at the time, I still thought my diet was pretty good. But one of my friends who's a nutritionist introduced me to um, a whole food product um, called Juice Plus. And literally that was like the catalyst for me to make other changes. I mean, I was pretty exhausted. Um, I literally would like go home, take naps before going out to dinner with friends because I was, I was just so tired. So when she introduced me to this concept, I was like, well, let me give it a try. We'll see. I'm not really into, you know, all the supplements. I don't, you know, the only reason that this appealed to me was that A, it was food and B, that there was some research behind it. So that was my first start in my journey. I started taking it and started noticing that I was um, just starting to feel a little bit better and um, starting to want to make other changes. And literally it, it, catalyst, it was a catalyst for me to want to make other changes because I started noticing little small things. And so from there, I literally went and started looking at just more research and wanting to learn more about how plants can improve our body and really kind of got pissed off because I was like, there's no one in the healthcare realm at all telling me about the, these things. And so it kind of put me on this path and this journey that um, I wanted to share this information with, with other people because it needs to be out there. There's so many people that are frustrated, just like I was frustrated. I just took time to like, okay, I'm done. I, I'm a pretty strong little person. I'm going to, I'm going to find my path. But there's a lot of people that aren't out there like that and that just need some hope. And so that's when I've met Dr. Chaz Mawala. We had really a same mission and and kind of partner together to create this this community here to get this information out to ha have people um, just have some simple tools that they can do uh, to get started and and really be that resource for people to come to 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 help you know change their lives just much just as much as we've done you know for, for myself and one of the things I love about this community is the fact that I literally can you know when I can't help a patient there's people in this community that I know that I can refer people to, to help in this community because, um, you know, I know they have the same philosophy. I know they're going to be taken care of. And that's one of the biggest blessings too from this because we have nutritionists and doctors and physical therapists and moms and teachers and so many people that, you know, when they have friends that need help and they, they just can only go so far with them then there's other people in the community that can really help them. And so that's one of the things that I love about this. And we do these events every 
months. <laughs> We've been doing them for, oh my gosh, Jason will probably tell you. I can't even tell you. I, I can't even count on my hands. We've been doing this for a while. So anyway, I want to leave it to Jay Sheree. She has a fantastic talk. It's one of my most favorite talks that she does. And I know she's um, changed up a little bit and made it even better. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen again. And then um, let's see. This is so weird. Whenever I share my screen, I can't do anything. Hold on. Need to... There we go. Okay. So as she said, I'm Dr. Jay Shree Chasmawala. I'm a family practice, lifestyle medicine, and integrative holistic medicine physician. And um, my journey started back when um, I was in college. So I was uh, raised lacto-vegetarian, and we traveled around a lot when I was younger. And when I moved to Texas, um, I suffered through what everybody here in Texas suffers through. If you're from Texas, you know what I'm talking about, allergies, especially springtime. And that first spring season in Texas, I got really sick. I had bronchitis and needed antibiotics for the first time in my life. And, um, you know, I got better, and then I didn't think about it again. I didn't have any more issues. I mean, I still had allergies, but they weren't that bad until I moved to Austin for undergrad. And Austin is like central for all sorts of different, um, it's called the Hill Valley. So there's all these different pollens that blow in through the air. And spring semesters, I would get so sick and I would barely make it to any of my classes. I would go and talk to all my professors and be like, I couldn't make it to class. Can I make up the lesson plan? And um, and that was basically how I spent my spring. And by the end of the spring, I would have bronchitis again and would need to be on antibiotics and steroids. And so then I went to go see an allergist when I came home um, through my mom's insurance. And they tested me. And when they did the um, skin prick test, I reacted so strongly to um, the uh, testing stuff that they had to dilute the the testing materials and at the end of all that he was like take Claritin and I was like I've been taking Claritin it doesn't do anything um so then I decided that I'm going to research on my own to find out what I can do to help with the allergies and on Austin campus there is a medical library so I was searching through different texts to find stuff for allergy and I came across this obscure um, natural healing textbook and it talked about the connection between dairy and inflammation and mucus and allergies and so I thought okay well I'm already vegetarian so I did, decided to give up dairy and it took me a, you know a couple of years to fully give up all of my dairy products but by the time I did I did not have any allergies since then and that was 23 years ago so that was my first connection between health and what we eat and how our overall health and well-being is. So when I went to medical school, I was super excited to learn more about nutrition and health. And I was so disappointed when there was no classes that covered nutrition at all. I think we had two hours of nutrition and it was all about how to tube feed a comatose patient. So I was like, well, this is not really anything about prevention. So after residency, I really made a lot of effort to um, to research and study and find out the connection between nutrition and medicine. And when I set up my own practice, my private practice, that was my intention was to be able to educate my patients on the importance of lifestyle. That way we could keep the amount of medicines and all the chronic diseases at bay. And that's when I met Stephanie. Stephanie was also starting up her physical therapy practice around the same time. And so she was going to different doctor's offices to introduce herself so that, you know, if we needed a physical therapy, we can refer to her. And Stephanie and I got to talking and we both found out that we had similar like um, philosophy of, you know, how the, how the body can heal itself and we just have to educate people. And she was already doing some amount of education in her own physical therapy office. So we decided to partner up and that was whew, 2009 or 2010, somewhere around then. And ever since then, we've been basically doing these talks once a month um, to reach out to the community because both of us believe that the current health care, that neither cares about health nor care. It's really more of a sick care model. And we feel that we just need to get this information out to the community, to the public, and create this whole grassroots movement of healthcare to empower people to really take control of their lives. 
So that brings us to today. I'm gonna to be talking about the gut. Um, and I just wanna make a little disclaimer, whatever I'm presenting is not medical advice. It's purely informational educational content. I'll share some simple tips and tricks to create healthy habits, but we're not gonna be addressing any specific diseases or treatment. So I'll cover what's the current system of health in, our, in the US today. And some of this also applies to, if um, anyone's logged in from other countries, to you know, most developed nations. We'll review what is lifestyle medicine. We'll then get into what the human microbiome is, what role antibiotics play, why do plant strong um, nutrition is so important, what are the role of supplements, and um, we'll discuss healthy habits. So as we get into the health of the US, um, does anyone want to share uh, what you think are the leading causes of death here in the US? You can write it in the chat, or if you wanna just unmute yourself and you know, shout out what is, or what are some of the leading causes of death that you know of? Heart disease. Heart disease. And Stephanie, if you can read out some of the um, people that type in the chat, because I can't really access that on my screen. So we have heart disease. Yeah, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Great. These are all wonderful answers. Um, smoking. And, I'm sorry, what was that? Smoking's another one. Mm -hmm. So perfect. These are first the top uh, three or top two is heart disease and cancer. Um, and the ones that I have listed in red are considered lifestyle related. So I'm going to put to you that these are not actually the leading causes of death in the U.S. These are symptoms of the leading cause of death in the US. And the leading cause of death is actually our lifestyle. 80% of all jet deaths are attributable to three major lifestyle habits that we have. Tobacco use, um, our poor nutrition, and a lack of physical activity. One in three Americans live with a form of cardiovascular disease. One in three adults and children are obese. One in three women and one in two men will develop cancer. And one in three adults and children will develop diabetes by the year 2050. So in general, Americans are not very healthy. We spend nearly $3 trillion a year on health. And that includes trying to find cures. That includes times um, people have to take out from work, um, things like that. So it's direct and indirect costs. $3 trillion is a lot of money. And 75% of what we treat and see in the U.S. is preventable. And you know, we all know the old adage, um, an ounce of uh, cure is worth a pound of prevention, or an ounce of prevention is worth a um, pound of cure. Sorry, I got that backwards. Um, and so really we wanna focus on what is this prevention? If we can save 75% of $3 trillion, that's also a lot of money. So that's why I am really passionate and, and um, a big supporter of lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine uses um, evidence-based therapeutic lifestyle approach to not just prevent and treat, but even reverse chronic conditions. Um, it's really effective, it's engaging, it empowers people, it empowers the patients, um, and it helps them take control of their own lives and of their own health. And it focuses on six major areas. Um, nutrition is the biggest. I, I'm gonna present to you why nutrition is the most foundational step of all of these big areas. Um, and then exercise is probably the second biggest and stress management is probably the third biggest. And then sleep, um, avoiding things like tobacco, alcohol, um, other addictive sub substances. Um, having healthy relationships, having a feeling of um, connection and community. These are all important aspects for our health. And when we do um, engage in all of these things, we can not only prevent disease, but we can also feel better. We can live longer. And I always like that because it's, it's more positive. Yeah, it's great to live healthy so that we don't get Alzheimer's and we don't get diabetes or strokes. But it's also great to have lots of energy and feel good and look and feel younger. That one's my favorite because as I get older, I'm just like so vain and I just want to keep looking and feeling younger and younger. Um, so 
that's one of the reasons, main reasons I engage with healthy lifestyle. I love this quote, cardiovascular disease is not something that naturally is, happens to us and we try to prevent with the diet. Cardiovascular disease is something that only happens with the diet that causes cardiovascular disease. So what does this mean? What kind of diet are we eating that causes cardiovascular disease? And what kind of diet um, do we need to eat to not have cardiovascular disease? Well, this diet, we call it the standard American diet or SAD diet. It's really high in oils, fats, fast food, processed foods, sugars, refined foods. Um, it's also really high in animal products like meat, fish, eggs, dairy, but it's really low in plant products, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, lentils, beans, nuts, and seeds. So this is going to segue into our... Um, microbiome segment because this is where we can really see why eating the sad diet is um, bad for us. So I'm going to leave this comic up here for a second while you guys so you guys can read it and I'm just going to take a little sip of water. Okay hopefully that was enough time but basically the gist of it is People are like, what, we have bugs living on us? Gross. And then we cut to a, a close up of the skin and there's a couple of bugs going, wait, we're standing on living tissue? Gross. So I'm gonna start with this amazing landmark study that was done in 2013. Um, and it was kind of like a, a groundbreaking because we finally started to see that there was some kind of connection between our um, bacteria that we have in our, our system and our health. And what they did is they took a group of regular omnivores, regular standard American diet people, and they gave them a steak to eat. And they measured a substance called triethylamine and oxide, TMAO for short, because that's a mouthful. And TMAO is known to um, be part of the pathway in causing cardiovascular disease and um, different cancers. So it's, it's not a good thing that we want in our blood system. And after people ate steak, they noticed that there was a significant rise in the TMAO. Then they got a group of vegans. I'm pretty sure they're probably whole food plant-based because you can't convince myself or most other vegans that I know to eat steak. But anyway, they got this group of people to eat steak. And they, they found out that the TMAO did not show up in their bloodstream. So they started to think what was different. They then gave antibiotics to all of the meat eaters and it wiped out, you know, antibiotics kills all bacteria. So it killed all of the good and bad bacteria in their stomach. And then they were given steak again to eat. And this time there was no TMAO. So they realized that the difference was the type of bacteria that lives in the body and that could the bacterial population that is in meat eaters be different than plant eaters and can that be some of the major causes for the difference that we see in the health picture. And then the study was um, done again, or maybe they were done concurrently, but it was published later that year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was basically the same study, except they used eggs, and they found the same results. And they were given um, antibiotics, and they found that, again, no TMO after giving antibiotics. Um, there have been a few other studies that just shows the connection um, between the bacteria and the production of this important marker, TMAO, and they found that this happens with red meat, and stopping red meat for even as little as four weeks decreases the amount of TMAO that's in the blood. Um, and it's also not seen with non-meat proteins, so plant proteins don't create TMAO. So what is this human microbiome? So we have about 50 trillion cells in our body and each cell has about a hundred, a thousand different strains and each strain has, you know, it's a hundred times of each strain. So there's, a, I can't even do the math there, like 50, 500,000 trillion, I don't know, cells. Um, this is when we start making up numbers. But basically the bacteria that we have in our system takes up about two to five pounds of our body weight. And most of it is found in our gut, but we also have some that lives on our skin and other areas of our body. And most of what's found in our gut is in the small intestine and colon, where the majority of the digestion and absorption of our food happens. 
And this bacteria is not harmful. We actually depend on this bacteria to live. This bacteria takes care of things like digestion. It's part of our immune system, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so we need this bacteria. We're totally dependent on this bacteria. And then this bacteria is dependent on us um, to feed it. So we have this symbiotic relationship with these bacteria. So when we eat, we're not just feeding ourselves and our cells and, you know, we're feeding all of the bacteria that's in our body. Um, and so we're not just what we eat, but we're also what the bacteria eat. And when we eat animal products and things that are in this bad diet, it changes the environment, especially in the um, stomach, the pH environment. Meat, animal products are alkaline, and our body and cell cells are meant to be alkaline, but the gut, the stomach, is supposed to be acidic. So when we douse it with alkaline foods, it decreases the acidity, and it doesn't allow that food to digest properly. So it, and it goes on to mess up the pH, the um, acid base response or balance. Um, and so when we start to increase that pH in our gut, creating a more alkaline, it destroys the good bacteria. When we eat foods that are um, rich in plants, it actually helps keep the acidic, um, acidity of the gut so that it can, we can digest better. And that's just in the stomach. So we have stomach acids in our stomach that we need to digest, um, but when, when it when you're dousing it, you start producing more and producing more, and that's when you get things like heartburn and other issues like that. So contrary to what people think, eating um, acidic foods actually contributes more to the problem because of the fact that it suppresses the body's um, acid and it raises the pH in the, in the gut. So our food, um, it, what we eat helps is metabolized by the, the um, bacteria that we have. And when we eat the wrong things, it triggers biochemical chain reactions um, that can create carcinogens, inflammation, such as TMAO, um, C-reactive protein, which is another inflammatory marker. And then I mentioned that it also takes part in our immune system. So the largest part of our immune system is in the lining of our intestines, in the lining of our respiratory tract, and nose and mouth. And what happens during this um, period, this is where a lot of our bacteria is, is in that space where the um, immune system is sitting in, in this light lining. It's called the mucosal immune system. So back and forth between the cells of the immune system and the cells of um, the bacteria, they're talking, you know, like the immune system's calling out, hey, is everything okay out there? And then the bacteria, the good bacteria are responding, yeah, it's all good, right? So they're waiting for this response. Now, when we disrupt this bacterial population, either by killing it off or by um, eating foods that, you know, the bacteria can't really digest and it starts to either be replaced by different bacteria or it starts to create byproducts um, because it's just trying to digest food that's not really food. It's processed. It's, you know, the, the bacteria doesn't consider it food. So then the you know, immune system's calling out, hey, is it, is it all good? And they're getting a response that they don't recognize. So the immune system's going, oh crap, stranger danger. And it launches out a full on um, attack, but it's just attacking food or other things that are not necessarily bacteria, bad bacteria, um, not necessarily an infection, but it's treating it like you know it's war and they're bringing out the big guns and that causes, it's kind of like the first leading steps to autoimmune diseases. And autoimmune diseases are things like allergies, asthma, you can cause food allergies, you can have um, other autoimmune disorders like lupus and other connective tissue disorders. So there's a wide range of autoimmune diseases there. And then our human microbiome, we there's this whole science that's called epigenetics. And epigenetics is that we have genes and we don't necessarily express these genes. These genes are expressed depending on our um, environment, what we're eating, stress, trauma, all of these things can decide whether or not our genes turn on. But it doesn't just turn on our genes or off, it also turns on or off the genes of the bacteria that we have in our body. So 
not only when we eat a certain way are we turning, um, like let's say we eat the SAD diet, we're turning off the good genes and turning on the bad genes of our own cells, but we're also doing the same for the bacteria. And changes in this bacterial population and the way they express their DNA, it can promote obesity, which obesity is um, tied to so many other conditions. I mean, currently we're seeing with the coronavirus that it's one of the biggest risk factors for whether to um, uh, predict whether or not a person's gonna have more complications if they get the, the virus or not. Um, it promotes diabetes. It, there's also a whole brain gut um, connection, which I think we discussed a few months, a couple months ago. And that brain gut axis can c control mood disorders, anxiety, ADHD, can even just brain fog can be from changes in your um, bacterial in environment. So why not just take an antibiotic? Remember we saw that um, when they took an antibiotic that TMAO was not created. The problem with taking an antibiotic as a means of um, maybe preventing diseases is that you one, you start creating resistant bacteria and we're already having this problem here in the US and other countries um, that a lot of the bacteria that we have are superbugs and they don't respond to any of the antibiotics even when we need um, to fight off a bad infection that's bad bacteria. And we are also, when we take antibiotics, it doesn't discriminate between good and bad. It's just gonna kill everything. It's gonna kill our good bacteria that we need for our survival and digestion and to feel good. Um, as we discussed this whole interaction, we need that interaction between our good cells and our good bacteria. And when we kill off all of our good bacteria, we allow the bad bacteria to flourish. Things like um, Clostridium difficile is one of the biggest um, and uh, biggest bacteria that causes a lot of problems. A lot of times we see this happen after taking antibiotics. The biggest culprit to that is clindamycin. And clindamycin is one that people take for like acne. So, you know, it's not, um, it's kind of given out very freely, but this, and, and all antibiotics are pretty much given out pretty freely. And any of them can cause this condition, and which can lead to hospitalization, complications, and even death. So antibiotics have their place. And then certainly if you are having an infection and you need an antibiotic, you definitely want to take an antibiotic. But more times than not, you, you know, if your doctor is um, wanting to prescribe you antibiotics, ask them, you know, is it absolutely necessary? Is there anything else I can do instead? Um, because sometimes as a doctor, I know we're just um, programmed to prescribe antibiotics. One, because most people want that. You know, we, we think, oh my God, I have a cold. We sniffle, we cough a little bit, and immediately we think we need a Z-pack to treat that. And, you know, I get into conversations with a lot of my patients about why we don't need it. And sometimes they just, they don't accept that because that's what they're used to with every other physician. Um, at my last job, I was really pressured to, you know, see patients in a, a short amount of time so that I could see more patients increase my volume and spend less time with each patient. Well, if I'm pressured to spend less time with each patient and somebody is being worked in because they're sick, um, just so I don't fall behind on my schedule, I'm, you know, a lot of doctors feel pressured to just go ahead and give the patient what they want. Um, so in another way, that's, way, that's where that um, antibiotic overprescription happens as well. And then our food supply is laced with antibiotics. If you um, are eating factory farmed um, beef or meat or chicken, I mean, they, they pack the animals in in such close quarters that if one, uh, one they're really going to be prone to infection because they're packed in so tightly and they don't really have room to move and and the smallest infection will spread through the herd so quickly. So they just automatically give everybody antibiotics. Um, and then same with the chickens. And sometimes they pump them full of hormones and other things. So if you're eating any kind of animal product, you're getting antibiotics through that. Even if you're eating um, free range or uh, grass fed, you're still gonna get a lot of the other um, animal proteins that's gonna cause problems with your gut because um, I said this before and I love this quote, is that even though we, or may, not, we may not be eating a full 100% whole food plant-based vegan diet, our bacteria, the good bacteria in our gut is 100% vegan. 
it does not know what to do with animal products with any kind of like meat, fish, eggs, dairy, anything like that, but it knows exactly what to do with um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lentils, beans, nuts, and seeds. So, you know, we want to keep our bacteria. We don't want to just throw it away if it's, you know, filled with bad bacteria. So again, I'm just gonna leave this up here while I drink some water. So what's the solution? The solution is plant strong nutrition, whole food, plant based. And um, what this means is we just got through talking about how um, these whole food, plant based foods, this is what feeds that bacteria and um, gives it the best possible environment to thrive in. Um, when you do eat mostly whole food, plant based, you're going to lower your risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes. Um, and other disorders. When you go the opposite way, you know, sad diet, it promotes the wrong um, bacteria in your gut. So you wanna make sure we're eating mostly fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains, lentils, beans, and nuts and seeds. And I'll say this a couple of times. The whole idea is um, dietary pattern. You know, of course, I'm vegan and I'm all for everybody being 100% vegan, but really it's more about what we're eating and not really the label. And it's about dietary patterns and not diet. So we wanna make sure our pattern is overall whole food plant-based and maybe the occasional, if you just have, want to indulge, you know, in the occasional um, meat product that you're um, doing, but that's gonna be very occasional. The majority of your foods are gonna be the whole food plant-based. And here's the nice little picture of all of them. Does anyone want to shout out about how many servings of fruits and vegetables we need to have a day? We have three, we have eight. Okay. Anyone Great. else? Seven to 10. Seven to 10. Great. Yeah, it's actually seven to 13 for a healthy um, young individual. And here are some things that you can choose from. Um, and I'm just gonna point out that beans and the lentils here that have the highest amount of fiber and fiber is one of the things that bacteria really, really love. So you wanna make sure you're getting some lentils and beans into your um, serving, but that's not included in the fruit and vegetable serving. So your fruit and vegetables are gonna be like the broccoli and cruciferous, the bananas, the Jerusalem artichokes, the blueberries and other berries. And then um, things like miso soup and tempeh, they actually have probiotics in them. So they're, they're actually gonna be really good for helping restore some of your gut bacteria. And these foods that we're using as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, these plant foods, they're called prebiotics because they actually feed the bacteria and help them thrive. And I'll go over in a second with the differences between prebiotics and probiotics. So seven to 13 servings as a healthy young individual. But if you're an athlete, say you're training for a marathon, you need more than 15 servings. And if you have chronic conditions and illnesses, you may need even upwards of 20 servings because these foods are very um, healing. So if we're eating normal and we're you know healthy and young and we're eating seven to 13 servings, we may never get to a place where we need to eat 20 or more a day because we're not really doing a lot of healing, we're just maintaining. But if you have a lot of chronic conditions, you wanna eat a lot more. And we know the more we eat, the more, the better we feel and the more difference it makes. Um, here are some books. I just kind of picked out some of the big authors that I love that are um, big proponents, not only of whole food, plant-based um, nutrition, but also of lifestyle medicine. Some of these uh, doctors here that are listed are the founding members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which we're trying to get to be a actual specialty. So we've got um, the China Studies, one of my favorite, uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Asselstein, How Not to Die by Dr. Greger, and um, Reversing Diabetes. I'm going to leave this up here for a second. If anyone wants to take a screenshot, you can do that. And then um, these are my favorite documentaries on health. Um, Forks Over Knives is 
one of the first ones that I watched, and it's still one of my favorites because it just covers so much and it's a wide range of um, information. It's basically the movie version of China study, um, prevent and reverse heart disease and prevent and reverse um, uh, diabetes as well as the engine two diet. Game Changers is another great one and then What the Health and Code Blue. And again, I'm gonna leave this here for a second if anyone wants to take a screenshot. So why can't you just take a probiotic? Why is that not the answer? And sometimes if you're taking antibiotics, it's good to take a probiotic because you wanna to try to replenish some of the bacteria that you're killing off. You wanna make sure that it's high quality probiotics. And most probiotics, they only contain four or five different strains, but if we're doing what's called prebiotics, um, which is the food that's gonna help the bacteria flourish. So once you eat, let's say you take probiotics, but you're not eating foods that are gonna help um, that to thrive, then you're going to have problems with those bacteria just gonna die off. So again, you're left with no good bacteria. And yogurt is not helpful because yogurt, um, one, it's dairy and that's gonna cause all sorts of problems, but it's supplemented with strains of bacteria that are not human derived. So it doesn't quite have a place in our own um, gut. So we wanna make sure if you're gonna do probiotics, the more important thing is prebiotics. And prebiotics are fiber rich foods, basically whole grains, um, lentils, beans, vegetables, fruits, mm -hmm. and nuts and seeds. And the difference, um, I like this picture because it kind of gives you the idea, what's the difference between an apple and a multivitamin is the same difference between a probiotic and actual food. Um, because an apple has 10,000 or more um, phytonutrients and minerals in it. And it's every one of them plays a little bit of a different role and it's a symphony of um, phytonutrients. Whereas maybe your best multivitamin has um, let's say 2025. 20, so there's a big difference between 2025 20, and 10,000. And what are you missing there? So you're not going to get the full picture. Vitamins also have an issue of um, they're processed, synthetic, they're isolated. So even the ones that say um, made from, <laughs> I'm sorry, my, my puppy's crying. Um, even the ones that are made from um, they say made from like whole vegetables and fruits, they're taking out, they're isolating out the vitamins and minerals. And so it's basically processed food. I equate that to when you see like white bread that says made from whole grains. Well, yeah, that's how it started. But then they processed out all the good parts and just left you with the starchy white bread. Um, and they don't, this, when you isolate it like that, it's not going to feed the gut the way um, fruits and vegetables do. Oops. There was a study that was done um, back in 2012, and it showed that um, women that were taking, that were older women that were taking um, vitamin supplements had a higher death rate than those that weren't. Now, we don't know if it, that's correlative or causative, but the fact of the matter is they were taking these supplements and it didn't help them have a, a decreased death rate, like they didn't live longer as a result of taking the vitamins. And there have been numerous studies since then that have shown that you know vitamins may actually be doing more harm than good. So a better investment in health would be eating more fruits and vegetables, among other activities. And this is a conclusion that they came up with after studying over and over again. Okay. So I'm just gonna to talk really briefly about the other pillars of lifestyle medicine. We have exercise, you wanna be as active as possible, try to get 150 minutes of vigorous or moderate level activity a week. So that's basically 30 minutes, five times a week. Um, and that can boost your immune system, help you feel good, have mental clarity and energy. Yoga is great because it combines both exercise and mindfulness. Um, you want to make sure you're sleeping because that's when your body repairs itself. You want about six to eight hours of continuous sleep. Um, it's important to manage your stress and spirituality is a great way to do that. It gives you meaning, hope, comfort, inner peace, 
Um, one of our friends that joins us on this, but she's, I think, out hiking right now, Miranda, she loves going out into nature and taking walks um, in nature. And that is her like stress relief. That is her getting in, top, in touch with her spirituality. So it can be whatever it means to you, but it's just a way to kind of connect your mind and your body. Drink plenty of water, it just helps flush out all the toxins and um, keeps everything flowing and fresh. And then min minimize other contributors, right? Like we talked about stress, you wanna stop smoking, minimize or avoid alcohol, stop recreational drugs. Um, we didn't talk much about this, but environmental toxins can play a big part of your health. Um, there's things called hormone disru endocrine disruptors and they have different effects in your health. Pharmaceutical drugs are actually bad for our health too. As many people know, like you start taking a medicine for one condition and then you need to take another medicine for the side effect of that condition and so on and so forth. And then you're on a whole like pharmacy of meds. So we wanna kind of minimize all these other um, contributors to poor health. And community, community is so important. It, we want to have authentic interactions that are positive. We get together with people that are like-minded, have similar purpose, give us a feeling of belonging. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we've been getting together once a month and we do different things like salad in a jar, um, potlucks with whole food plant-based and everybody gets to try out a recipe. Um, we always have some education and some food. We've done making power bar or energy balls um, we've done oats in a jar, burrito in a jar, and everybody loves it. It's a great way to come together and learn how to, to meal prep and be healthy. So um, I love this comic and I kind of um, personalize it for me. It says that Dr. Chasmawal is a quack. She has been treating me for obesity for many months and I'm only getting fatter. I guess she is. She's been treating my cough too. And if anything, it's getting worse. But when we zoom out, we see the real picture here. So the important thing is, you know, we've gotten a lot of information today, but we want to be able to actually use that information, incorporate it into our lives. And that comes down to creating healthy habits that we can sustain for the rest of our life. Um, I love this book, Atomic Habits, because it really talks about how to get into good habits and break bad habits. And really, um, you know, it's, we wanna work on setting up good habits, not to reach a goal, but to be a better person. So in the book, it really talks about how, um, you know, we can set up goals, like let's say, okay, I wanna be healthier, and so I'm gonna run a 5K. And I'll like set up, oh, these are the things I need to do to run a 5K, and then, you know, train a certain amount of times a week and increase my miles. And then once I run the 5K, it's like, then what? Do I, most people might just go back to being a couch potato. So the end product is not to run the 5k but to be a healthier person so each habit that we're doing is to create um who we want to be so like if i'm trying to change to be a morning person which i kind of am then i want to make sure that i'm doing things like um getting to bed earlier or turning off the tv earlier so these are the habits that i want to get into and when we look at habits you know we want to make it obvious we want to make it attractive easy to do and satisfying. We don't want to spend a lot of energy and time trying to, you know, create good habits and then break bad habits. And to break a bad habit, it has to be the opposite of creating good habits, right? It's got to be not obvious, unattractive, difficult to maintain and unsatisfying. So like one of the things that I did when I wanted to cut out chips is just not have it in, this, in the house. And if I was really craving chips, then I would have to like make a specific trip to the store. And, you know, so it was not really um, attractive and it made it difficult. So we want to implement healthy lifestyle and it's about making small changes. We can set goals, but the goals are on, you know, they're kind of our markers to see how we are into becoming who we want to be. And, you know, sometimes those goals can change. So, you know, but we're working on being a healthier person. So we can focus on one change at a time. You, we all know when we set up new, new year's resolutions, you know, it's like, I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to, um, drink lots of water and meditate and you know and then by july 2nd you're not doing any of it because you're like if i can't do one thing i might as well not do any of it but that's not really the way we want to go at this we just want to start one small thing at a time and when you start building on your small changes you can change many things for example let's say for the month of july i want to increase my vegetable intake 
So this is where we can create like a SMART goal for July, right? The specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time managed, right? So I can eat one more serving of veggies with each meal. And as I achieve, you know, let's say I've done it for a week, I can give myself little goals, you know, Mark, sometimes people like to put stars on their calendar. So it, it gives you something to do. You can keep a journal of all your achievements and that way you can review it and feel good and motivated. Um, so these are the things that you can do. And then in August, it's not like I'm going to stop my servings of veggies. I'm going to continue on that and then build to the next, you know, goal that I might want to have. So we're just kind of building on each of these things. And then forgive yourself. If you mess up, no one's perfect. It's all right. Remember we talked about that it's a pattern of healthy habits, a pattern of what you're eating versus your overall. You know, it's not about everything has to be perfect. So this is really a call to action, not a call for perfection. So one of the things that I love and we love doing in our community here is a, what's called the Shred 10 program. Um, I love it because it just brings together all of these things that we talked about. It emphasizes whole food, plant-based nutrition. It brings together community. We have recipes that we share. We have um, accountability. We do, um, I think our next one, we're gonna do like a meal prep um, demonstration. And when we would do these in person, people loved them. Um, especially someone like me when they saw, cause I don't cook worth anything and they can see that even I can make simple preps. Um, and it also takes into account the habit theory. It makes things attractive, easy, takes out the decisions from our lives and it offers the accountability. Um, and that what it consists of is making sure you're eating a lot more whole food plant-based, taking you know, time, deep breaths, drinking lots of water, making sure you're exercising most days, getting good sleep. And then you're eliminating gluten and dairy because those have been shown to be the highest um, inflammatory markers as well as there's some other whole things that we can get into about that, but eliminating sugars and then reducing caffeine and alcohol if you're taking that at all and trying not to eat after 6 or 7 p.m. and eliminating or pro uh, reducing all of your processed foods. We also recommend um, doing one or two complete shakes a day and incorporating maybe the juice plus capsules. And those are because they just make the um, transition to follow these different guidelines easier and it takes out some of that decision making um, that you have. So, and Stephanie mentioned Juice Plus, so I'm just gonna go into just a little bit about what it is. It's basically what I use as a tool to help us get into our healthy eating goals. Um, it's a whole food plant-based nutritional product. It's 30 different plant powders. And they capsule, put them into capsules. So all you have to do is, you know, people love taking pills. So you can just down the capsules or they come in delicious chewable forms, which kids love, but adults like me love them too. And it's straight from the farm to a capsule. Um, you can see these are all the different fruits and vegetables that are in there. And it provides a variety that you may not get. Now it's not to take the place of eating healthy. It's just to bridge the gap. For instance, I had a patient that just would not eat any fruits and vegetables whatsoever. He's a, like in most cases here in Texas, he's a steak and potatoes guy, and he didn't even want the kale that garnishes the steak to be on his plate. Um, and sometimes he would eat potatoes and sometimes not. And so he's like, okay, I can see why I need to eat fruits and vegetables. I'll start taking this product. And in six months, he was telling me, he's like, I don't know what this is, but I am craving salads. And he started eating a lot more fresh salads and a lot more fresh vegetables. And he was trying to incorporate a lot more vegetables into his um, diet, which I thought was great because it's really about that. It's about making sure we're eating the healthy habits. And so this is just a catalyst. The other thing that Stephanie mentioned that there's research, these are um, peer reviewed, published in independent clinic, um, in a lot of big name journals. Um, so, I wonder if I can skip this. So these are just some of the journals. Um, I think they've had over 25,000 participants in these research um, things that they've done. And it's really thoroughly researched. And these are some of the results that we've seen. It helps it, uh, boost the immune system because it feeds that gut flora, unlike um, other isolated vitamins and supplements. Um, protects the DNA, helps with cardiovascular wellness. And you know, there was a study that was done that 
I think it was double blind placebo controlled and they basically gave placebo to some people and fruits and the fruits and vegetable powders to the other people. And they found that the people that were taking the fruits and vegetable powders had higher antioxidant oxidation in their body, which is a good thing. Um, they had higher bioavailability, so it showed that it was actually absorbed, reduction in DNA damage. They had um, healthy, higher markers of T cells, which indicated higher um, immune system. And then they actually started reporting that they weren't, the group that was taking Juice Plus wasn't getting as many colds and flus as the other group. So it's just one of the things. Um, and these are some of the centers where some of the research is done. The other product is the Juice Plus Complete, and it's a um, milk, it's a, not milkshake, it's a non-dairy um, drink mix, and I love it. It tastes great, and it's 100% vegan and non-GMO, and it has um, fiber in it. It's one of like the only protein drinks that has fiber in it, so it really contributes to feeling good, and it's just made with um, lentils and grains and a few vegetables. And then this is um, another product that Juice Plus Company has to offer. And when they came out with the Tower Garden, it really increased my faith in this company because they're like, okay, yeah, it's great to eat fruits, um, a capsule, but we are really serious about getting people to eat more fruits and vegetables. So we're going to put a farmer's market on your back porch and allow you to grow um, beautiful, fresh uh, herbs and vegetables and greens, and anyone can do it because I can't even keep aloe alive and I've been able to have a thriving um, tower garden. So here are some pictures. So after watching this, um, we have a few options. You can do nothing and nothing will change. We can find out like what are one or two key changes that you might wanna take away from this talk and how you can improve your health and well being. You can join us on our next Shred 10. Um, I think we start one on the first Monday of every month. And I love it because like each time you, you do the 10 days of getting yourself all in for the um, habits and then you kind of relax, but I find that one habit always tends to stick each time. Um, and then you can also partner with us and help us spread this message of health and get this grassroots healthcare out there into the community. So we are um, right at three o'clock. I know we said we're gonna end at three. Um, so we don't really have that much time for questions, but all Stephanie and Jennifer and I will be here until I think about four. So if any of you guys want to stay on, you are more than welcome to um, and ask questions. Pictures. <laughs> Woo. We need the pictures first before anyone oh, yes. leaves. That's right. So if everybody wants to turn on their camera and um, who wants to do the screenshots? Oh my gosh. Okay. If y'all challenge me, I will do it, but I have to do. I forgot what I need to press for a screenshot. Um, I could do like a cut, 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 cut and paste. So, okay. Everyone was smiling. I think we have a few people that still need to turn on their camera cameras. Ah, got it. Got ah. it. One more, one more. <laughs> All right. Got it. Okay, great. So what questions do you have here? I can unmute everybody or you can unmute yourself um, if you're going to speak. There's one question in the... Um, in the chat on Satan. Yeah. So I'm going to address Satan as I would any other um, uh, products that we have, like uh, the ready made veggie burgers or the protein, plant protein products that we have. They're great transitional foods. Uh, you know, people have been used to eating meat their whole life and they want to transition to having less meat. It's great to have things like Satan and Beyond Burger and um, What's the other one? Impossible burger, things like that. Um, but as you get into eating more whole food, plant-based, 
um, you want to eat less of those kinds of foods and eat a lot more non-processed. And it's okay to eat it every once in a while. Like I'll have um, a veggie burger every once in a while, maybe like once a month or so. Um, and I try to really stay away from seitan because I've found I've gotten like a gluten intolerance. So whenever I eat it, I get um, kind of mucusy and bloated and I don't sleep as well. So I try to stay away from gluten. Um, so for me, I don't use seitan, but again, if, if you can do it and you do it every once in a while, you know, it's, it's a great transition food. Um, <laughs> there's a question that says, how do I create a diet plan for non-compliant patients? I think it's really about finding out what kind of foods that they like. I mean, there are so many vegetables and fruits and whole grains and lentils and beans, varieties of um, ways to prepare them that you can really get into that. Um, one of the things that we have, we have different um, recipes that were put together by different members of the community. So it wasn't just like me putting together all of my favorite recipes. It's like everybody in the community putting together their favorite recipes. And so you can find something that you're going to like. And so you work with that. We kind of build on, okay, if you like, you know, butternut squash and a few other things, let's start with those things and then work on building from there. So any th time when it's coming to like exercise, do the exercise that you love to do um, instead of the one you think you should do, right? And that way you're actually motivated to do it. So we're talking about the habits of making it attractive and easy. I think also too, like with, with it's kind of similar to my story and similar to the story that Jay Sheree said, um, is that sometimes when people are so exhausted and they don't even know where to start that you even ask them to do something small and it's just overwhelming. And this is, this is one way that I use Juice Plus in my practice to, to literally just get people started so that they, if they're consistent with it, they will start craving other things. They will start having um, some more energy to where um, they'll want to do more. And um, that's a good stepping stone. It's true. Um, so one of the fruits that I just do not like at all is papaya. And if you put me in the same room as a papaya, I'm just like, get, get it out of my like vicinity, right? And I remember I'd been on the Juice Plus capsules maybe for a couple of years and I'd been somewhere and they served a fruit plate and they had orange fruit on it. And I just thought it was cantaloupe. And I put it in my mouth and I was like, oh, this is papaya. I didn't love it, but it didn't have the same reaction as I did before, which would have been immediately spit it out of my mouth and be like, yuck, right? I just was like, oh, this is papaya. It's not so great. And I ate it, right? <laughs> so that's a big change for me. Um, Leah asks about testing for T cells as part of our regular CBC. We don't test specifically for T cells, but part of the CBC is what's called white blood cells and lymphocytes and monocytes and different things. So if there's something off there, they might do further testing. So T cells are just one of the white blood cells. It says, what do I suggest to replenish the normal flora in the gut after an antibiotic session? Um, because in their medical practice, they're telling patients to take yogurt. So you can do a high quality probiotic, but really it's about what foods are they eating, making sure that they're eating whole food plant-based, lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, lots of um, lentils and beans, because those are filled with fiber. Now, if somebody hasn't been eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and you increase their fruits and vegetables, they're gonna have some stomach issues. So you kind of wanna help transition them so that Again, you don't want to like overwhelm them and it was bad and oh my God, I tried to eat salad and I had major diarrhea and I'm never doing that again. So you kind of work with them to slowly increase these things. <laughs> Jennifer sharing that the same thing happened with her to, to her with avocado. She used to hate it and now she loves it. And that's a funny story. It's the same thing with me. Prior to my giving up dairy, I hated avocados. And after, like, I don't know, it was sometime after college, I noticed that I just loved avocados. Eczema is an autoimmune condition. That's the question. Um, is eczema an autoimmune condition? And is there a way to permanently get rid of eczema by changing diet? And there is. Um, I've been looking into eczema a little bit more because it's uh, something that I also 
um, have been dealing with most of my life. And eating, um, obviously, whole food, plant-based. But I found that whenever I eat gluten, my eczema flares up. So like I said, gluten and dairy are major inflammatory markers. So even if we're not specifically allergic to them, they can cause all sorts of different reactions. So that might be something to try and change. Um, doing a couple of rounds of Shred 10 can really help get your body kind of normalized or reset. And then um, there are some, I'm, I'm just looking into this, so I may get with you, Leah, later and we can discuss, but there are some like herbs and stuff that you can take that help further clean out the bacteria that you have that could be contributing some of the um, eczema. Dana shares that she's bought stackable containers and fills them with different ready-to-go veggies. That's awesome. <laughs> um, that's great. Meal prep is really the way to go because if it's there and ready, I know for me so many times if I have my salad there and ready for me, um, I'm very much likely going to eat it and because I made the effort to make it and, you know, I won't do that whole opening up the fridge and staring in the fridge and then, you know, closing it and then grabbing like snack foods because they're easy and available. So Gina's sharing meal prep has really helped her a lot too. I love it. I love these um, tips, not just questions. Um, for lupus clients, it's still going to come back to whole food plant-based. There's a question about any diet recommendations for lupus clients. It's still going to come back to whole food plant-based. Um, so I would say um, that that's what it comes down to. That's what I love about the whole food plant-based lifestyle, even the lifestyle medicine lifestyle. It's the same prescription for every condition out there. So it's not like there's a different diet for um, lupus or MS or cardiovascular disease or, you know, and there might be some tweaks that we make in there, but overall it's the same diet for everything, whole food plant-based. And it all comes down to the gut and how we're um, creating our gut health. Shaibesh shares that it's been one month and he started to drink strawberry, blueberry, banana shakes with almonds and walnuts. And he's amazed that he craves that every day. I know I'm the same way with my smoothies. So I have a smoothie every day. This is a Vitamix container. So you just mix it straight in there. Um, and when I travel, well, Stephanie knows when I travel, I half my suitcase is filled with food, but you can't bring smoothies. So by the end of the weekend, I am craving smoothies when I get home. So I bring a blender. I know. You're so My blender has traveled with me all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> She's got this cute little blender, and I'm like, I need to do that too. What other questions? So I'm going to stop the recording. So if anybody's nervous about that.